So welcome back. This video is going to talk about latent variables. So we've been discussing dimensionality reduction methods like principal components analysis. We're soon to uh, discuss factor analysis. When I introduced this module, I said that there were a number of applications. So we tend to use these methods for visualizing data. Um, maybe we use it as a pragmatic way to reduce the number of variables we have. One of the um, applications that I mentioned was a latent variable. So I'd like to talk about what exactly that is in this video. Now, this is a data mining course, and the next topic that we're going to cover is exploratory factor analysis. So the purpose of exploratory factor analysis is to start with data and figure out what are the latent variables that are really being measured by these variables. So in order to really do that, you need to have some grounding in what a latent variable is. I pulled a definition from another Ebert book. Remember when we did clustering, I really loved his uh, cluster analysis book. He also has a book on latent variable models. So a latent variable is essentially a hypothetical construct invented by the scientist for the purpose of understanding some research area of interest, here's the important part, and for which there exists no operational method for direct measurement. So for example, if you wanted to study my height, it would be very easy to measure that. There's a, an operational method for measuring my height. You take out a ruler and be done with it. But what if there are other types of variables like your intelligence or socioeconomic status or any number of personality traits like uh, your need for cognition, meaning are you the type of person who likes to think, uh, self-monitoring, so that's how closely do you monitor uh, the way other people, are, other people perceive your, your actions. Are you extroverted? Uh, likewise, any number of attitudes that you may have. So uh, do you have racial prejudice as an example of an attitude? How would I measure that? Um, likewise, we're going to encounter these things when we get to te uh, text analysis. So if I have a bunch of documents, and maybe these are all legal documents, and I want to know uh, the extent to which this is about criminal law. So that would be uh, a, a latent variable that we would need to measure. The, the study of latent variables then is defining what these latent variables are and then coming up with measures of them and then using them in your study. There are a few other terms that get used. So construct is also used instead of latent variable. Sometimes people split the difference and they just call it a latent construct. So any of these terms mean the same thing, latent variable, latent construct, or just construct by itself. So how do we measure these things when they don't have any direct way of measuring them? The answer is we can measure them through their manifestations. So these manifestations are sometimes called manifest variables. So let's say that we have some construct. So as an example, maybe this is your math ability. So I, I have no ruler that I can stick inside your head to measure your math ability. Instead, I could give you various problems. So let's say I have problem one, problem two, all the way through problem P. And your ability to solve these problems reflect your mathematical ability. So these are all imperfect measures of your math ability, but they are manifestations of them. So I could give you an algebra problem, and if you have high math ability, you would be able to solve that. I could give you a geometry problem. I could give you some calculus problem. And so the, the point is, this underlying construct is going to determine your success on these tasks. 
there are also errors that get associated. So there are idiosyncratic factors that would affect your ability to answer these as well. Alternatively, this could be something like, are you liberal? Well, what does it mean to be liberal? I could ask you a variety of questions that measure your positions on different issues and your agreement with those might indicate how liberal a person you are. So the purpose of this video is to really answer the question, what are the characteristics of, a, of good measures? And in the next video, we're going to start talking about exploratory factor analysis where we discover these latent variables starting with the data. We're not going to have time to do confirmatory factor analysis in this class, but if you have an interest in the subject, there are a lot of references out there on this and you'd want to read that, read about CFA next. So there are many ways to develop a measure of one of these latent variables. One approach that I follow is Churchill's five-step process. I'll just mention a whole lot of references down here. So there's this book by Sass that does a really good job. If you ever have to write one of these up, I would suggest looking at this book because they tell you all of the things that you need to do to write it up properly. Another really good article is this one in MIS Quarterly. So this article has been cited tens of thousands of times by now and it walks you through a step-by-step -step process that's a little more elaborate than the Churchill process. I think this has something like 10 steps in it, whereas Churchill's only has five. There's some other books out here. Nunley and Bernstein is a very famous book on psychometric theory that, that talks a lot about these ideas as well. But for the purpose of this discussion, I think Churchill's process will be good enough. So if we want to measure a latent variable, we first have to specify what we mean by that. And so that's referred to as describing the construct domain. So what attributes are associated with this construct? So if I wanted to measure your mathematical ability, the first thing I would have to do is to describe what I mean by mathematical ability what sorts of skills and knowledge are associated with mathematical ability. This could be as mundane as which topics get included. Do I count calculus as your mathematical ability? As another example of this, uh, I had to construct a measure of students' knowledge of current events. So, so if you wanted to measure how well-informed students are, the absolute first thing you have to do is to say what you mean by a current event. So is a current event only what happens in politics? What about pop culture? Do Lady Gaga's dogs disappearing uh, count as a current event? What about sports? Do sports count? Uh, so you cannot really measure current events knowledge until you say what you mean by a current event. Now, let me just kind of jump ahead. Where we're going to go in the next lecture is trying to uncover what these dimensions are from data. Now, if we were constructing measures, having specified the construct domain, then I would go generate a sample of items. So items are the, the manifest variables. So I could write a bunch of questions asking your knowledge of different things that just happened as a test of your current events ability. Likewise, I could write a bunch of math problems if I wanted to measure your mathematical ability. So when I write the final exam for this class, I'm gonna to try to get a measure of your comprehension of the material. So I'm gonna to have to write a bunch of questions that measure different aspects of your comprehension of this material. After I have the items, I'll go execute this survey or this instrument on a bunch of subjects. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna purify the measures using one of the techniques that we have in this class. In the next lecture, you're gonna to have to do this with factor analysis.
This video is going to talk about a simpler model, which is called the coefficient alpha model, but either of these would be acceptable. The basic idea is that not every item that we wrote out will, will go with the latent variable that we're interested in, and so we have to identify the items that load on it and drop those that don't. Finally, we're going to describe the quality of our measure by assessing its, its validity and its reliability. I'll be defining those terms in a minute. So let's talk a little bit about the measurement theory. So an observed variable is assumed to be some manifestation of the latent variable, but there could be some biases and there could be some errors associated with this. So let me give you some examples of biases and errors. So Sometimes you have stable characteristics of a respondent. So a classic example of this could be something like, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. So you could ask me a question, and because of this, I don't give you the true answer. I will say something nice because uh, that's the way I was brought up. This would be an example of a bias. Another example of a bias is a situational factor. So maybe you ask me a question, but because I'm with a friend, I don't want to reveal my true attitude on something, and so I would not tell you the truth. That would be another uh, bias. There could be transient personal factors. So if you ask me some questions when I'm tired, hungry, and grumpy, my responses may be different than if you ask me the same question after I've had a nice meal and a good night's sleep and probably a cup of coffee. So uh, instrument administration could also create a bias. To give you an example of error, there's item sampling. So if I'd asked you a different set of math problems, you'd probably get a slightly different answer on the test. That's an example of random error, assuming that all my math questions are from the construct domain that I'm trying to measure. Another example of error is what's called instrument ambiguity. So different people could be reading the questions in different ways, and if that's a problem, then that's just going to add error to your measures. Reliability and validity are some characteristics that we would like to have for our measures. What's reliability? Well, Reliability is the extent to which measures are free from random errors and yield consistent results. So if I gave you one test of your mathematical ability, then I gave you a different test of your mathematical ability with slightly different questions, what I would hope is that I come to the same conclusion about your mathematical ability. Alternatively, if I gave you one test, and then I gave you another test, and I came to completely different conclusions, that would indicate a lack of reliability. So I don't know if any of you took one of the standardized tests multiple times, but if you did and you got different scores, that would indicate a lack of reliability. Validity, on the other hand, is the extent to which differences in scores reflect true differences across individuals. So if I had one student who had a high score on the math test and another student ha who had a lower score on the math test. Validity means that the, score, the student with the higher score actually has more mathematical ability than the student with the lower score. Now there are many ways that a measure can lack validity and I've listed some of the major ones here. So one of these is content validity. So content validity is the adequacy with which the construct domain is captured by the measure. So if my goal were to measure your mathematical ability and I constructed a test that only had geometry questions on it, we would say that test lacked content validity because I'm just measuring a portion of the construct domain. I'm not measuring the whole thing. Likewise, if I'm trying to measure your 
knowledge of current events and I only put sports questions on there, we would say that lacks content validity. Another example of this is that we used to teach the SAS programming language in this program. And students would take SAS certification exams during the program. These tests measured your ability to program in SAS. The problem with the tests, though, in my view, is that they often measured the student's ability to write syntactically correct SAS code as opposed to solve a programming problem. So they only measured whether you could get the syntax right as opposed to can you think through the logic of creating a program to do some task. So the reason for this was it was all multiple choice and uh, it was harder to measure a student's ability to solve a problem on a multiple choice test, whereas it was much easier to ask about uh, the syntax of the language with such an exam. Another type of validity is criterion, which refers to the degree of correspondence between some measure and some sort of criterion variable. Now, there are two types of criterion variables. There's predictive validity and concurrent validity. So with predictive validity, we're asking whether the measure of the latent variable correlates with some criterion that occurs in the future. So a classic example of this is to what extent does a GMAT score predict performance in grad school or perhaps something later than that? You know, so to what extent does your GMAT score predict your ability to get a job and be successful in, a, in your career? So last year, the University of California, so all the UC schools, said they would not consider the SAT or ACT scores when making admissions decisions. The reason for this is probably that the scores were not valid, that they that they did not predict the type of success that University of California cared about. So what do these tests measure? You can go over to one of the test websites and they'll tell you what it measures. So this is what they mean by verbal reasoning. This is what they mean by quantitative reasoning. And this is what they mean by analytical writing. So uh, I've spent a fair amount of my time looking at applications, so student applications, and I've always wondered, should I pay attention to analytical writing? Usually with the quantitative students, uh, you all do extremely well on the quantitative reasoning. You know, you're all sort of 95th percentile and above on that. And you're quite good on verbal reasoning. What, um, where we see differences is on the analytical writing. So then the question is, should I consider analytical writing when I make my recommendations on admissions? The answer to that question depends on, should we care about the construct domain? So when you read through this, you'd think we should, but we should also care about whether we have a, whether this is a valid measure of this domain. Concurrent validity, on the other hand, measures whether the criterion exists at the same time. So the classic example could be something like a pregnancy test. A good pregnancy test would accurately assess whether or not the subject was, was or was not pregnant. I'd like to give you another example of predictive validity. This concerns the measure of customer satisfaction. So this was a headline about 10 years ago. So Walmart had done many customer satisfaction surveys and found that customers were not satisfied with their shopping experience. The main reason for this was cluttered aisles. So if you've ever been to a Walmart's, Walmart store, they have so many SKUs and it's really hard to find stuff. And so Walmart uh, launched an initiative to declutter their aisles. Now the reasoning behind this was that if they could declutter their aisles, customer satisfaction would go up and hopefully they would have more loyal customers and their profits would go up. What actually happened was the decluttering caused satisfaction scores to increase, but then their in-store sales 
went down. So, so by having more satisfied customers, they actually lost money. This is actually a pretty well-known phenomenon. Uh, in this article that I wrote, we did a literature review of customer satisfaction literature, and many other authors have found the same thing as the Walmart study. So for example, there was an article in Bloomberg Business Week that said proof that it pays to be America's most hated companies. There were other studies that showed a negative correlation between the satisfaction of a company's customers and their stock performance. The final conclusion of this article was, if anything, it might hurt company profits to spend money making customers happy. There's also been books written like this, Customer Satisfaction is Worthless, uh, Customer Loyalty is Priceless, uh, Customer Satisfaction is Dead but It Won't Die Down. So my point with all of this is that customer satisfaction lacks predictive validity. So as a for-profit company, you ultimately care about creating profit, but customer satisfaction does not predict that, and so it would lack predictive validity. Construct validity refers to whether measures correlate with other constructs as you would expect. So customer satisfaction and customer loyalty could be two constructs, and if, if satisfaction doesn't correlate with loyalty, then we would say it would lack construct validity. A last criterion is discriminant validity. So discriminant validity means that the measures don't correlate too highly with, them, with each other. So if we go to the Wikipedia page, they give one of the classic examples, which is, is narcissism distinct from self-esteem? So narcissism has sort of a negative connotation to it, where self-esteem has a positive connotation, and the two are, are correlated with each other, but they're not the same thing. You're going to have to be making decisions about this when you get to factor analysis, and you, and you want to make sure that the factors you recommend are distinct from each other, i.e. that they have this discriminant validity. I'll now talk about one measure of reliability. This is called Cronbach's alpha. So let's say that y is the latent variable that I'm trying to measure, and that I have p measures of that variable. So this could be your true mathematical ability. Each of these x's could be your performance on p test questions that I give you. What I'm going to assume is that your performance on this test question is your mathematical ability plus some errors. I've dropped the possibility of biases. That's obviously a problem. In order to account for that, we're gonna need a fancier model, which factor analysis will provide for us. So if I wanna estimate what is your mathematical ability, what I'm gonna do is simply add up your scores on these P questions. That'll be my measure of how strong your mathematical ability is. This is sometimes called a summed score. The key point here is I'm just adding up the individual items without any weights. So what alpha tells us is the squared correlation between the true latent variable and your measure t. So you can think of it as being like an r-squared. If I could regress this measure that I have, this t measure, on this unobservable latent variable, it would tell me how much of the observed variation in my test scores are accounted for by the construct. Now, there are rules of thumb that are pretty universally used. Whenever you have an alpha greater than 0.8, you have a very solid scale and any journal on the planet would be very happy with that. Alphas between 0.7 and 0.8 are regarded as okay. Something between 0.6 and 0.7 is weak, kind of questionable. You might have a hard time getting something like that published. An alpha less than 0.6 is definitely a problem and I wouldn't use it. So let me walk you through an example. To Suppose I wanted to construct 
a measure of some subject's attitude towards a newspaper. If we follow Churchill's procedure, we need to identify some items. So here are some items that were on a survey that I wrote once. So overall, how would you rate this particular newspaper? Another question, to what extent does this newspaper meet your expectations? Another question, how likely would you be to recommend this newspaper to friends? This is sometimes called the net promoter score question because this question gets used in creating these uh, net promoter scores that a lot of companies use. Another question, to what extent do other members of your family share your feelings about this newspaper? How would you rate the value for the money of this newspaper? And then thinking of other communities like yours around the country, how do you think this newspaper would compare to the newspapers in similar communities? So all of these have something to do with my attitude. The question I want to get at is, do these form a scale? So we can run Cronbach's Alpha using the psych library. There's a function called Alpha in there. So if I run alpha on these six questions, I get a couple of things. First off, I get the raw alpha, which is about 0.78. If you remember the guidelines I gave you, this is an okay scale. We're getting close to that 0.8 cutoff. The other thing that we get is the reliability if we drop an item. So I like to think of this as being a little bit like backward selection. If I dropped one item, what would happen to my alpha? And so what you can see is that if we got rid of question 41, question 41 is how would you rate this newspaper? Alpha goes down by quite a bit. It goes from 0.78 to 0.7. So dropping that would be a bad idea. Likewise with the next two questions. However, if we got rid of question 46, alpha would actually go up. So alpha is telling us that question 46 really doesn't fit. It's like this must be measuring something else. So I wouldn't recommend just dropping items because alpha goes up. You really need to think about what is the construct you're measuring and does this question fit in that construct domain. You're going to be making exactly the same decisions when you get to factor analysis in the next video. So to what extent do other members of your immediate family share your feelings about the newspaper? Well, clearly, this is not about how I feel. It's about how I think my other family members feel about it. So maybe my wife likes the newspaper and I don't like it. That's okay. Uh, my wife's opinion is not my opinion. And therefore, this doesn't really fit in the construct domain. So I can make a strong case for dropping this. So let's go do that. So I've just gotten rid of the fourth question, namely question 46. So notice my, al my starting alpha is going to be 0.83 in this case. And if we get rid of question 49, alpha goes up to 0.88. So let's go look at the item and think about whether this is measuring something in the construct domain. So this is measuring how I think this paper compares with other papers in similar communities. That's not a real direct measure of my attitude towards this paper. And so I think we can make a case for dropping this as well. So now my alpha is 0.88. If I try to drop anything else, we see that alpha goes down. And therefore, the four questions I have left are probably a pretty good scale with uh, alpha equal to 0.88. I'd want to think about the content validity. Just make sure that each of these questions really tap into my attitude towards the local newspaper. So how would I construct a measure of this overall attitude? I could just add up the questions, or I could divide by four. Whether I use the sum or the average doesn't really matter because these two are going to be perfectly correlated. The correlation will be one. It's just that the total uh, is four times larger than the average. So it's kind of like um, 
inches versus centimeters. It doesn't really matter which one I use, they're just expressed in different units. What we've done is we've purified our scale using Cronbach's alpha. We are going to do the same thing with factor analysis shortly. As I mentioned earlier, purifying is not just a mechanical process. Drop a variable if alpha improves. You need to be thinking about the definition of the construct and whether that item fits it. This next slide gives the statistical details. You might wonder, how did I ever find the correlation between the total and this unobservable thing? These slides walk you through the math of that, and I'm not going to do this in this video, but you can follow through the steps if you're interested. The last thing I want to talk about is something called the attenuation bias. This is the reason that we care about constructing good measures of our constructs, of our latent variables. What the attenuation bias says is that if you use a measure of something that's polluted with air, so if I tried to use uh, a single test question as an indicator of your math ability, that would be a very noisy measurement of your math ability. So if I use that in subsequent analyses, what happens is various measures of the relationship between this latent variable and other things will be attenuated towards zero or shrunk towards zero. So let me show you why that's the case. Let's say I'm really interested in correlating two things, x and y. So this could be your math ability and your performance in this program. For the sake of this slide, I'm going to assume that both of these have mean zero and certain variances. So sigma squared sub x is the variance of x. Sigma squared sub y is going to be the variance of y. And let's go remind ourselves what the correlation between x and y is. So remember the correlation is just the covariance divided by the products of the standard deviations. Since my means are zero, this is just the expected value of x times y over the products of the standard deviations. All right, fine. But let's say I can't measure x directly. Instead, I can only measure some proxy. Let's call that proxy x tilde. And this x tilde is the original x plus some noise. So this x tilde is the true x polluted with noise. <clears throat> so this happens all the time with physical measuring devices. So maybe I have some sextant and I'm on a boat and I'm trying to measure the angle between some star and the horizon. Of course, the boat is moving around. I take some measurement, that's an x tilde, but there is in fact a true measurement between the horizon and that star. It's just that it's being polluted with this air. So this example of taking measurements of stars was one of the first examples of a measurement air problem. So it's a problem of great importance, importance in the history of statistics. So the big question I want to answer is, what happens if I correlate this noisy measurement with y? Will I still get rho? So in order to answer this question, let's go find the covariance between x tilde and y. So it turns out the covariance is the same as it was before. So it's just e at x, y. So I'm now in a position where I can compute the correlation between x tilde and y. So it's just going to be the covariance divided by the ratio of the standard deviations. So the expected value, so the covariance is unchanged, but notice there's more noise in my x's. So what is the variance of x tilde? It's the sum of these two variances, the variance of x and the variance of the errors. So if I do a little bit of math, what we see is that the correlation between this noisy measurement and y is the same as the correlation that we had between x and y times this attenuation coefficient. So notice this thing has to be one or less. If the variance of my errors equals zero, this thing reduces to one and I get the same thing. But as soon as I have errors with some variance, this thing will shrink and my, my correlation between the noisy measure and y will be attenuated. Recall that if you use OLS, 
uh, the slope estimate is just the estimate of the correlation times the ratio of the standard deviations. So my point here is that regression coefficients will also get attenuated if you use noisy measures. Something else that should worry you is that this formula does not depend on n, so big samples don't help you. Big samples will, re will reduce the standard errors and make it easy for you to reject the null hypothesis that a correlation is zero, but you still have these attenuation biases regardless of your sample sizes. So big data doesn't fix the, the measurement error problem. So I've cooked up a little example here where I've rigged two variables to have a correlation of 0.8. So x and y have a correlation of 0.8. But what happens if I correlate y with x plus some errors? So the answer is, uh, with, with a certain amount of error, I don't see a correlation of 0.8. I see a correlation of 0.56. And this would be true regardless of how large my sample size is. So let me give you a specific example of this. I correlated a service scale, which is composed of these six items, with the readership of the paper, and I got a certain correlation. Notice, this correlation is greater than the correlation between readership and any single item. So those would be like, this is like an X measured with noise. This is a separate X measured with noise. And this is consistent with the attenuation bias. What do we do about this? So one thing that we can do is collect multiple measurements of x and then just average them. That's what I told you to do a couple slides ago. So if I have a bunch of test questions measuring your math ability, I compute your, um, I compute your average test score, that's going to reduce the attenuation bias. It's not going to go away, but the, the variance of this is going to decrease with p. A more sophisticated approach is to use structural equation models, which I'm not going to cover in this class, but if you're interested in this, it's a topic that you should go read about. These are a rich class of models that allow us to handle measurement error and relating latent variables that are all subject to this measurement error that we're avoiding.